Hello, everyone. We're going to get started in just one moment. Thank you for joining us this evening. Okay, so thank you all so much for coming. I know there's some people still filtering in here, um, but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, tonight's program is also going to be recorded. So if anybody comes in late or if you have a friend who would like to see this or um, you want to watch it again, um, it will be on the library's YouTube page um, in a few days. So hello everyone and welcome to our author event uh, with Carolyn Campbell. Um, as she discusses her book, City of Immortals, Père Lachaise Cemetery, Paris. I am Jill McEwen. I'm the Adult Services Manager at the Wilmette Library. I just want to do a little housekeeping and let you know that tonight's program is held via the webinar format. And what that means is you all can see the, um, tonight's author and me, but we cannot see or hear any of you. The presentation will be followed by a Q&A from you, the audience, so please feel free to submit any questions throughout the program in the Q&A section of Zoom, and then I will do my best to get to all of them at the conclusion of the program. I have also turned on closed captioning, but if you cannot see it for any reason, you may need to adjust the settings on your own device. Um, so, Without further ado, uh, Carolyn Campbell is a published writer and an exhibited photographer. Her debut nonfiction work released by Goff Books, City of Immortals, what we're gonna discuss this evening, um, made the Los Angeles Times best time, I'm sorry, bestseller list, which is awesome. A summa cum laude graduate of the Maryland Institute College of Art, and she has held positions with the Corcoran Gallery of Art, the American Film Institute, which is so cool, and the UCLA School of the Arts and Architecture. When not on her book's lecture tour, she works as a communication specialist to the arts, um, philanthropy, and social justice communities. So thank you so much. And um, Carolyn, if you would like to turn your um, mic on and start your video and... We will go ahead, I will share the screen. We'll go ahead and get started. Great. Thank you, Jill. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, my deepest appreciation to Jill McEwen and the Wilmette Public Library for inviting me this evening. No cemetery is more rewarding and historically significant than Père Lachaise, which is in the far Eastern part of Paris. It's one of the most idyllic places really a forest with 5,000 trees. In the fall, it's a festival of color with the sounds of songbirds overhead. And in spring, the air is filled with the sweet smell of chestnut blossoms. It's also the largest green space in the entire city. Though it's a modern garden cemetery style, its layout is very urban, 107 acre cityscape with winding streets, pathways, and directional signs. It became a model for cemeteries as a place to stroll, a, fu a fusion of nature, sculpture, and memory. This brings to mind a favorite quote by Honoré de Balzac, who was buried there. I seldom go out, but when I feel myself flagging, I go out and cheer myself up in Père Lachaise. While seeking out the dead, I see only the living. Before we go on a tour, I want to go back to how I became a passionate Francophile. I have my hometown of Washington, DC and beloved Corcoran Gallery of Art to thank. I grew up in Washington and flew my kite under the 500 foot tall marble obelisk that is the Washington Monument and ran along the football field size length of the reflecting pool in the summertime. I didn't know until high school that the city was planned by a Frenchman, Pierre Charles L'Enfant. He was responsible for the elegant design of the National Mall with its wide boulevards for strolling and gardens bordered on one end by the Potomac River. It formed the perfect backdrop for great monuments celebrating history and culture. At age eight, I would take the bus west past the White House on Pennsylvania Avenue and turn on the 17th Street to the Corcoran Gallery of Art, where I went to the Saturday children's art classes. 
I was in awe of that revered American, what uh, revered American architect Frank Lloyd Wright called the greatest example of Beaux-Arts architecture in the United States. Who could have imagined that many years later, I was hired as the museum's first director of public relations and special events. I got to create receptions for visiting dignitaries and hold press previews for exhibitions set in the impressive 40 foot tall atrium with its Doric colonnade. It was during a staff meeting at the museum when the conservator Robert Wiles, who moonlighted as a travel agent, said to me, Carolyn, someone on my charter has canceled and he asked, did I want a round trip ticket to Paris? All I had to do was pay the tax. Well, I hurriedly made my plans for my first trip to France. That same week, an artist at an exhibition opening heard I was planning to go to France, and he knew that Oscar Wilde was my literary hero and told me that his ancestor, Sir Jacob Epstein, sculpted the monument marking Wilde's burial place. Did I want to go to Père Lachaise? I had my first destination. And this is where the story begins. On my first visit in 1981, I became enthralled with the cemetery's rich history and artistic significance. I vowed to return as soon as I could, so in 1982, I commissioned a colleague, British photographer Joe Cornish, to join me and create what I envisioned to be a nostalgic photo album of this Elysium of the Afterlife. Three decades later, we are still captivated by this ever-changing, by its ever-changing beauty and mystery. When I told Joe that we had a book deal, he quipped, I had hoped we might publish our work about Père Lachaise before we were buried there. I discovered that Joe and I were not the only ones in love with the cemetery. It is known as the most famous resting place in the world and welcomes three and a half million visitors each year. It's the fourth most popular site in Paris after Notre Dame, the Eiffel Tower and the Arc de Triomphe. However, during the pandemic, it was closed and only briefly allowed funerals. Now France is open to all tourists. So what was the genesis for this cemetery? In the first place, over the centuries, war and devastation of the, and the plague had already filled the catacombs and church graveyards across Paris, the traditional burial places. There was an incident when a heavy rain caused a major flood and a shared wall of the Cemetery of Innocence and an adjacent building collapsed, spilling thousands of corpses into the homes of the unsuspecting apartment dwellers. 18th century Parisian engineers had overlooked one significant item in their urban design scheme, what to do with the ever increasing population of the dead. Those apartment residents and many other citizens complained to the young new first consul, Napoleon Bonaparte. So Napoleon directed his engineers to solve the problem. Nicolas Frochot, prefect of the Seine, proposed holding a competition to create new cemeteries on the outskirts of the city. The first ever commission of its kind was awarded to architect, landscape, and urban designer Alexander Theodore Brogniart. Oops, and for some reason, I've got Father Lachaise up here. I must have Flip my slides, we'll get to this later. <laughs> However, people were not thrilled about a long trek to the countryside for burial or visitation. Plus, the bishops did not like the idea of losing money, but the church had no choice. They had run out of room. Frochot had a keen sense of how to appeal to the masses by creating something intriguing. He convinced Napoleon of a plan to win over the critics as well as the hesitant clientele by naming the cemetery after Father Lachaise, who we see here on the screen now, the Jesuit confessor of the popular Sun King, Louis XIV. He launched an inventive, an inventive real estate promotion, filling the cemetery with sculptures and the remains of the famous and the infamous, including Moliere and La Fontaine, we see here, and the ill-fated 12th century lovers, Heloise and Abelard. The grand opening of Père Lachaise was held on May 21st, 1804. We have the 19th century architects to thank for moving away from the Christian dominated imagery of a cemetery as filled with macabre soundness and a frightful place filled with dead bodies. So moving to the pantheistic view of a cemetery that reflects a more peaceful concept of a sweet rest. After all, the earliest interpretation of the word cemetière was a place where one sleeps. 
Etienne Louis Boulet, one of the most admired architects of the period and the mentor of Bourgeois art, was a proponent of the pre-romantic celebration of the divinity in nature. Brogniard carried out this concept in his revolutionary garden style plan that has stood as a model for cemeteries in the US and Europe, including Highgate Cemetery in London and Mount Auburn in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Let's look at the map to get our bearings as we walk through the cemetery. Remember the layout as we start at the very bottom and we will work our way up. The three tours in my book are designated by the color shading. The dark green area to the bottom right in tour one denotes the oldest section founded in 1804. Etienne Goethe served as the chief architect of the city of Paris in the early 1800s. Known for his neoclassic designs, he created the main boulevard Menilmontant entrance to Père Lachaise, which consists of an elongated horseshoe shaped driveway with a pair of tall central gates by, uh, topped by two carved medallions. These bear the classic funerary symbols of the torch representing life's flame and the winged hourglass symbolizing the passing of time. As you enter these massive gates and walk up the main aisle, Avenue Principal, passing the graves of writer Colette and Louis Visconti, one of the architects of the Louvre, one encounters the monumental sculpture O'More, translated to the dead, created by artist Paul Albert Bartholomew. Originally designed as a tribute to his wife, the monument features a mournful procession of 21 men, women, and children marching toward a dark doorway into the next life. The site also serves as an ossuary that contains the remains of many thousands of Parisians. When other cemeteries in the city were closed or when people's graves in Père Lachaise were reclaimed due to negligence or for lack of rent payment, remains were placed in the ossuary. You'll see the two small doors to either side of the sculpture. Those are the entrances. French architect Hector Guimard designed the only completely Art Nouveau tombs in the cemetery. Guimard was strongly influenced by Eugene Violette Leduc's ideas about ornamental structures. Guimard is best known for his entrances to the metro stations throughout Paris, including the Père Lachaise metro station, which has distinctive lettering, arched signage, and curvaceous metalworks on the railings. If you walk around the tomb, Guimard's atelier's signature appears in the lower right corner near the back of the dove gray marble tomb. One of my favorite areas of the cemetery has significant landscape history before Brochniard applied his design scheme. The original 16 acre site was the Jesuit retreat of Father Lachaise, previously called Mont Louis. Yes, there are mountains in Paris, others are Montmartre and Montparnasse. Mont Louis, a thousand foot elevation, create some steep walks when you visit. The bucolic site was planted with lemon groves, rose gardens, tree arbors, and many winding paths, ideally suited to the contemplative life of its former inhabitants. It is now called the cemetery's romantic section, which was the original area founded in 1804, and now serves as the resting place for luminaries, such as composers Bellini and Cherubini, and Chopin. I just wanted to point out, this is a picture taken by my colleague, Joe Cornish, taken on All Souls Day at dusk, when visitors leave votive lights and garlands of flowers. So if you happen to visit Paris in the fall and you're there around November 2nd, please make a point to visit cemeteries there and um, to see the particular uh, celebrities. Brochniard died in 1813, so many of his grand schemes never made it off the drawing board, including his dream of a monumental period as a focal point in the cemetery. Historians have been fascinated with Egyptian civilization since antiquity. In France, the obsession with Hot was highlighted by Napoleon's campaign in Egypt. Obelisks and pyramids, which appeared on buildings all over Europe, became a prominent feature throughout Père Lachaise. Today, it is a charming mix of structures with elegantly styled crypts, 
next to oversized mansions of the dead, encircled by rows and rows of modest headstones, creating the effect of an enchanted architectural theme park. The architectural, architectural designs in Père Lachaise represent an encyclopedic group of many periods. You would have to zigzag to every corner of Paris to find such a comprehensive collection of the city's important sculpture and architecture, reflecting many periods and styles of art and design from early Roman times to the present. Fortunately, the tombs in Père Lachaise parallel the city's artistic growth and houses all these styles. Rochniard's original plan was complemented over the ensuing decades by hundreds of individual tombs created by an impressive roster of designers, sculptors, and architects, many of whom are credited with creating the significant urban plan and public structures throughout Paris. Some of those individuals are interred within the cemetery. Charles Percier, along with his architectural associate Pierre Fontaine, are interred together in the far eastern part of the Romantic section. Their site is marked by a tall stell, topped with an urn, with the symbol of the Masons incised in a stone panel at its base. They were largely responsible for the popularity of the Empire style of the era. One of the numerous projects Napoleon hired them to design was the grandly arcaded stretch of housing on Rue de Rivoli the second longest street in Paris opposite the Louvre. Considered one of the first theorists of modern architecture, Violette Le Duc was a noted scholar, restorer of medieval buildings, central figure in the revival of Gothic architecture, and the author of a 10 volume history of French style. He won the commission with a colleague to restore the Cathedral of Notre Dame. Upon completing the Notre Dame project, Violette Le Duc became chief of the Bureau of Historic Monuments. That same government office now oversees the city's preservation of cemeteries. He also took commissions for various tombs and monuments, including the ornate mausoleum we see here of the Duc de Mornay in, Port in Père Lachaise. Evidence of the architect's vast knowledge of design is displayed in this elaborate creation. A tribute to the language of stone and form through its many layered finials, to me sometimes appeared like an aging wedding cake. <laughs> no offense, Violette Le Duc, I just uh, I was really taken by this piece when I first saw it. Built in 1894 and designed by Jean Camille Formigé, the name Columbarium comes from Columba, Latin for dove, and originally referred to the compartmentalized housing for doves and pigeons. On some days, the plume of smoke spirals up from the chimney, signaling the operation of its crematorium. To have one's ashes placed in the columbarium, one can choose an underground vault or a niche for small urns in the two-tiered loggia outdoors. To access burial niches on the upper tier, one uses the staircase. Several cultural icons rest here, including dancer and choreographer Isadora Duncan, and African-American novelist and poet Richard Wright. Patrons often paired architects with sculptors when commissioning a tomb. Artist David Donger produced some 56 sculptures throughout Père Lachaise. These include the equestrian monument to General Jacques Nicolas Gobert, seen here, and the bronze bust of the novelist Honoré de Balzac. Sculptor Antoine Atex has numerous examples of his work throughout Paris, including Père Lachaise. He was commissioned to create the rectangular panel sculptures of peace and resistance on top of either side of the east facade of the Arc de Triomphe. These and other high profile commissions established his stellar reputation. However, his most famous work is the tomb he designed for fellow artist Theodore Jericho with bas reliefs of the painter's artworks including the Raft of the Medusa on its base. When visiting this tomb, as with many tombs in Père Lachaise, make sure to do a full circle. And in this particular case, look at the signature of Atex, which is under the bronze pillow where Jericho's left arm rests. Atex also designed the family tomb of Francois Vincent Raspail, who was jailed for his participation in the 1848 revolution. 
A text depicts sorrow via the poignant artwork titled Madame Respy's Farewell to the Jailed Revolutionary. The ghost of Madame Respy stretches her arm out from beneath her shroud toward a barred window. Leon Baudet was one of the romantic Beaux-Arts architects of the 19th century. And he won the competition with sculptor Danger to design the tomb of Napoleon's general, Maximilian Sebastian Foy. It's an elegant Greek Doric monument of, uh, with Foy standing figure in the center. Baudoyer was part of the group known in Paris as a company of romantic radicals. Their projects often elicited the disapproval, disapproval of the conservative Beaux-Arts academics. Controversy followed artists as well as architects and the American born sculptor, Sir Jacob Epstein caused a stir with his monument to Oscar Wilde. He carved the tomb from a 20 ton monolith um, extracted from an English quarry. It presented an enormous challenge to the artist who spent nine months carving the large stone on site without referring to preliminary smaller models. A nude winged sphinx, the crown, the figure's head, and the hairstyle are reminiscent of the winged Assyrian bulls in the British Museum, which date to 710 to 705 BC. The wild sculpture was one of Epstein's earliest commissions made possible through the patronage of Helen Carew, a member of Wild Circle. The work received high praise following the press preview, but due to its prominent male parts, was condemned as indecent. The sculpture on Wilde's tomb was at one point covered with a tarp by the French police. It was the last scandal attributed to the revered writer. Many pilgrims come to the cemetery bearing mementos to leave at the grave sites. Flowers, photos, a personal item, letters, even in the occasional marijuana joint at the grave of Jim Morrison of the Doors, what you see here. And sometimes small pebbles. A Jewish tradition signifies having visited a loved one as seen on the grave of Gertrude Stein. Beside the tomb, tombs of writers, such as Persian novelist Sade Hadayat, a new tradition has recently sprung up. As you'll see on the lower left side, a small jar filled with pens and pencils, both as a symbol for the scribe and turd, as well as I suspect a ready implement should one want to jot down a thought to leave behind. My own desire to speak directly with the departed is what inspired me to create what is the heart of my book called The Conversations. I chose eight cultural icons and asked about their triumphs and failures as well as any wisdom they wanted to share with us above ground. The eternal staying power and drama of funerary monuments appealed to the artists who contributed to the mesmerizing environment of Perlachez. Their use of funerary symbols such as draped urns, hourglasses, bats, skulls, and mourning figures not only echo the styling of societal taste, but also delivered on the promise of visceral awe and wonder in the land of the dead. Bats on tombs illustrated the eerie side of eternity. There's many, many bats there. I have a special collection. I think I found about 20 on different tombs. Skeletons and skulls or other death symbols remind the viewer that death is a part of life and unavoidable. Winged finger, finger figures solely replace the death's head or soul effigy. These figures are generally considered angels. The word angel comes from the Greek word angelos, which means messenger. The chief duty of an angel was to carry messengers, messages from God. Statues of women in the 18th century often represented the seven virtues. Prudence, justice, temperance, fortitude, faith, hope, and charity. Powerful examples of how women are seen to embody some of the deepest qualities of the human condition. In Père Lachaise, there are a few scantily clad female figures. Sometimes family members unaware of the sculptural commission must have been alarmed to arrive at a grave site and discover a half-naked damsel in apparent erotic rapture rather than in deep mourning. So at Père Lachaise, we are confronted with the great paradox of this vast burial ground, which embraces serenity, horror, anguish, and acceptance, the grand sweep of the human experience. Day after day, year after year, the city of immortals awaits its next visitors. 
I wanted to take this moment to mention prior to writing City of Immortals, I had designed the fold out custom map, which I've included in the back pocket of the book. So for those planning a trip to Paris, you can explore the cemetery in advance. Visitors to Père Lachaise many times find themselves lost in this 107 acre labyrinth. The fold out map is the result of decades of thorough pathfinding that makes navigating the cemetery's 97 divisions less daunting and far more enjoyable. Measuring 16 by 18 when open, the map easily fits into a pocket purse or backpack. The text provided in English, French, and Chinese notes local bus and metro lines, as well as the visiting hours and suggested visitor etiquette. Illustrated with my color photos, it makes an ideal gift or a personal keepsake. Shortly after designing the map, I designed the GPS tour, featuring the grave sites of 84 cultural icons with images of the tombs and the exact location of the site. This is the same tours that I give in the book. With this app, three different custom walking tours of Père Lachaise in both French and English can be viewed on your Android or your Apple smartphone. The GPS function of the app is activated when you arrive at the cemetery, or you can take a virtual tour from the comfort of your own home. So whatever method you use, I hope you enjoy, enjoy your visit to Père Lachaise. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And I'm just gonna share, um, change my view for a moment here so you can see both of us. And um, so for those of you in the audience, please feel free to write questions in the Q&A. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, is there still room for more bodies and can anyone be buried there today? Yes, there are. It's very popular, needless to say. So there is a waiting list. Um, I think currently there's 300. However, um, the fortunate ones that either, uh, number one, have a family crypt there can have immediate access. And there are two qualifying um, things that uh, will allow you to be buried there. Number one, that you were born in Paris, and two, that you died in Paris. And that is the reason why Jim Morrison was buried there and got access because he had lived in Paris the year before and he died there. So yes. You can and you can also have your ashes spread so the expense of a tomb is not a question you can go to the columbarium and have be cremated and then instead of being in a niche you there's something called the jardin du souvenir of the garden of memories and you can have your ashes spread which fertilizes the beautiful rose garden that's there <laughs> oh interesting um do you want to be buried there <laughs> I don't want to say it here, but I have an arrangement to be sprinkled in a corner, favorite corner. So. Love it. Love it. Very cool. Um, mm. That's great. Um, so first of all, I want to ask, because, um, you know, when you were especially were talking about all the different bats and the skeletons and the different um, you know, decorations that you noticed throughout the cemetery, how did you go about researching everything as you were going through the cemetery? Like how, like how did you research all those intricate little details? Well, what I can say in this short time, I spent, I did spend 30 years <laughs> um, going through the cemetery. Um, and I had a, a wonderful opportunity, um, both in France and here in the United States of having access to historians and um, also people who are well-versed in cemetery lore. And so there are many colleagues who have become really close associates over the decades who have shared with me their research. And I too, we, we both are always swapping, you know, information. There are, in the book itself, there's an entire section called Designs on Eternity. And I designate, you know, the open book, which is the open, is like a heart. Um, uh, there's, a, a, a column that is, is, is kind of cut means a, a life cut short. Um, a lot of boulders in place represent God or power. So it, it was a combination of researching in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, as well as many um, libraries here in the US. And again, interviewing people, I interviewed the curator at the cemetery and there has been subsequent, I think four different curators since I uh, started this book. 
So it's still an, an adventure. I'm still to this day, I plan to go this fall and I look forward to finding new things. Great, thank you. Um, somebody just asked a question that I was also going to ask you. Um, do relatives have to pay an annual fee for any relatives buried there? There is a fee, literally, you rent your space, or um, in the case of like Richard, uh, rather uh, Jim Morrison, you can purchase a plot in perpetuity or until the end of time. And um, so there is a price. However, I mean, they're, they come in like 10 or 20 years. I don't know why someone would want to have a temporary tomb for a relative, but in the case that you don't pay the rent, they give you a grace period, or if the tomb falls to disarray, they give you several years. If it's not kept up, they literally disinter the person there, put their remains in the ossuary and make it available to the next person. Mm -hmm. uh, a relative, yes, um, you know, can make this arrangement and there are certain fees for different, I mean, there are some grand monuments or they're very simple headstones. So depending upon, and if you do plan to do something elaborate, there is an architectural committee that has to approve the design. So it's okay. Yeah, so actually, I'm glad you said that. Somebody else asked if there was any sort of um, limitation on the types of tombstones or sculptures within the cemetery. It was an interesting, um, Georges Méliès, who is a famous French filmmaker who um, basically uh, created the, um, a lot of the illusions that you find in modern films now. And his granddaughter wanted to restore his tomb it over the years, the bronze um, bust had stained the, um, you know, the oxidized st stain on the, um, the marble and someone vandals had broken parts of it and she campaigned to have it restored and just to have it restored was $40,000. Um, and she, it took her, but we did a campaign. I reached out to some film people in Los Angeles and tried to get the entertainment industry in, uh, involved in it. Had a break during the pandemic, but it was restored. Uh, however, she had to go through an architectural committee, a restoration committee. The people um, who are talented in restoration are very expensive, but it's a beautiful monument. Um, I do feature it in the book. But um, I don't, if, the, if again, there are some very interesting contemporary artist tombs. There's one of a it looks like a cello that's exploding. I mean, it's a sculptor and this is the style that of his artwork and it obviously was approved. But there's also very modest plain headstones or a flat um, kind of um, um, tomb gravestone or something like that that's not very elaborate. Or you can go, as we showed with the Isadora Duncan and Richard Wright, a small marble niche cover that goes if you're cremated. So. There's a lot of variations, but if you want something elaborate, it has to go through approvals. <laughs> That's great. Um, and just a, a really quick, you know, because I'm a librarian, so I have to always suggest like read-alikes. Um, there's, a, there's a podcast called Ologies, and one of the episodes is all about gravestones throughout the world. And the host talks about how in Europe and, you know, countries outside of America that renting your, your space in the cemetery is actually not all that uncommon. Mm. So, yeah. Um, it just, you know, seems unusual to us because that's not our practice. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, do you know if you, if you die in Paris, let's, oh, if you did not die in Paris, can you still have your ashes spread? Yes, you can. There oh. is, there is a fee and um, there's always, a, this is, I should say, this isn't a, a private cemetery. We have many private cemeteries in the U.S. and Europe all over, but Père Lachaise and Montmartre and Montparnasse Cemetery are um, you know, civilian cemeteries. They're run by the city of Paris. So they have a very bureaucratic process and there are, you know, price, uh, I'm, quite frankly, it's escaping me at the moment, how much that, um, you know, using the um, Jardin de Souvenir and so forth, exactly that cost is, but there is a fee for everything, yes. Uh, so, um, have you, I don't know if you've been to, um, there's a big cemetery in New Orleans where Nicolas Cage has pre-purchased his <laughs> monument and it's a, you know, it's a big um, pyramid. Right. So, I, when you were um, talking about, I'm going to butcher his name, um, 
Broken Yard? Broken Yard. Great Broken Yard. Um, Roll I that NG. <laughs> okay. I was wondering if he was, maybe if Nicolas Cage was inspired by him, you know, the big pyramid tomb. Well, the pyramid, again, this fascination with Egyptian and um, history and so forth, the things with the, there's supposed to be a preservation thing with the, with the pyramid and that anything in the center of a pr the pyramid would either uh, reach everlasting life or be preserved. So I think that kind of concept has spilled over to modern times. Um, I'm not quite sure. I think, again, Brojniar probably loved the idea because it was very classical at that period. But again, um, for whatever reason, there is a large um, monument at the top of the Père Lachaise where the pyramid, I think he envisioned it. But again, I think the popularity of Egyptology and so forth was one of his inspirations. But that's, oddly enough, I was not that interested in cemeteries before the young man told me that Oscar Wilde, I don't think other than in my book, I talk about going to Arlington Cemetery to see my grandfather buried. And But I have since gone to Bonaventure Cemetery in Savannah. If you can imagine a 19th century cemetery with Spanish moss hanging from the trees along a riverside. So I've become pretty fascinated by, and the ones in New Orleans are quite remarkable. Yeah. Because my water table, they're all above ground and they're very elaborate. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Um, so do you, do you personally have a favorite um, monument or gravestone there? Now you're going to make me choose all some of my favorites. <laughs> or like, yeah, what are some of your, I know it's hard to choose just one. What are well, some I think the one that's on the cover, which is a, the, a one of the, fe the female mourning figures are some of the most theatrical and beautifully um, created sculptures um, in the cemetery. And um, she is on the tomb of a French architect and his wife. Um, I obviously have a personal um, favorite with the, the tomb of Oscar Wilde. I had the um, wonderful uh, um, experience recently at the UCLA uh, library, uh, the Clark Library, which is one of the largest um, collections of the work of Oscar Wilde. His grandson came to speak and I got to meet him. And we talked about um, the whole kind of scandal. Uh, in my book, I talk about preservation of, of cemeteries and how important it is because they suffer from vandalism and acid rain being exposed. And everyone kept kissing Oscar Wilde's tomb. And this was, you know, and, and, and uh, his name is Merlin Holland is the grandson. He said he understood that it was just this passion that people had, but the lipstick was staining the porous limestone and every time they went to clean it, it would take a layer of detail from the sculpture. So when people, you'll see in the book that it is covered in a plexiglass shield now to protect it, but people are still climbing over to kiss the tomb. So I always go to visit to see what kind of condition it's in. But again, Chopin is another one, again, because of it's, it's so beautiful and the beautiful medallion of his profile is there and then the the muse of music the young girl with the lyre and again all the symbol symbolism that comes with those but those are three of my favorites mm -hmm. <laughs> i love that because there's 107 acres it's hard to pick and choose oh my gosh yes have you um have you ever like walked from kind of like this end to this end like, have you ever just like, like, or maybe like around the perimeter to see how long the walk would take? I wish I had put a pedometer on my ankle for all the times that I have walked. I recommend that people not spend any less than two hours there, unless they're going to say, you want to go see Oscar Wilde's tomb or you want to see Chopin, then you can make a direct, you know, line to that. But I, again, a minimum of my sister is, is going to visit with me this fall and I told her to get in shape <laughs> because she lives in San Francisco. She says, oh, I do hills all the time. And I said, but we're really going to do some hiking. So um, I've spent an entire day in the cemetery and never repeated my, my steps. Again, if you can imagine 107 acres with a thousand foot elevation, it's quite high I mean, there's steep staircases. Um, it's like, again, like a forest. Some of it, the paths are nothing more than dirt, you know, leaf strewn, you know, alleys between the tombs and so forth. And there's other broad cobblestone um, 
streets, literally. But I minimum two hours, I could easily spend five hours, take a break. There's, you know, a little cafe out the front gate and have a, a really stiff espresso or two and go back in. <laughs> I like that. I like that there's a cafe right outside of it. Yes. That's smart. Um, there's a comment from um, one of our patrons. They wrote, Mount Hope Cemetery is high on a hill in Rochester, New York. It is beautiful in springtime with the wildflowers. Have you ever been there before? No, I have not. There's quite a few cemeteries in New York that are on my bucket list. And you know, one of these days. <laughs> yeah. But it's nice to hear about Mount Hope. I'll, I'll jot that down. Um, so in that vein, I have to ask, um, have you ever thought of branching out and doing another book on another cemetery? I know you said this is 30 years in the making, <laughs> um, but. I think because Père Lachaise is really considered the granddaddy of all graveyards that and what would I pick or choose? I have colleagues who have written books about you know, there's a friend of mine, Douglas Keister, who wrote a book on all the Paris cemeteries. There are other books. And I purchased, I've, I've got a library here that is every, you know, again, every cemetery that comes out, either I visited, I, I purchased the book. But no, I think Père Lachaise was kind of, for me, the pinnacle of, again, it started the whole concept of a garden style cemetery. There is one that I would like to visit, uh, Stagliona in Genoa, Italy. If you can imagine the Italian 19th century version of this overlooking the sea. So it's, a, you know, it's a, a waterside hills. It's a, a, be a beautiful with equally dramatic um, sculptures as Père Lachaise. Yeah. If you can imagine the Italian sculptors like Bernini doing, you know, graveyards and, you know. But no, I think Père Lachaise, I think this is it. <laughs> I do a lot of ess essays and I've contributed um, chapters to other books, but. Um, I think I've done my cemetery book. Yeah. I've got a couple of other books in mind, but. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the pictures are, they're unbelievable. How gorgeous it is there. Um, so I have a few more questions. Um, can you talk about the, if you know about the management structure of the cemetery site? Well, there is an administrative office, which is right off to the right of the front entrance, where one can pick up a little Xerox map as a souvenir. I, I did that initially, but in fact, it's a, it's a sheet of paper and you think, oh, this will be easy, but you don't realize all those little teeny dots, those little dots represent a tomb in the midst of about 60 other headstones. So if you don't know what you're looking for, I mean, it was a treasure hunt for many years. I, it took me about six years to design the map, just from plotting out where everyone was because the existing maps that are available are are just very small and really tokens. They don't really help you find anything, but um, there is a, it's called a conservator, which is the director of the museum, excuse me, um, too many years in museums, um, in, in the um, cemetery. There are staff, there are different administrators taking care of, the, the, obviously it's a business. It's, you know, selling grave um, sites as well as arranging for funerals um, arranging for different burials. There's also all of the guards, the, you know, the people who, um, it's, it's a, a really a challenging job um, to maintain and, and keep an eye on everything. There is, when the, the place closes, all they do is ring a bell. So if you don't get to an exit in time, <laughs> I've, I've run down the path <laughs> of the main avenue to get out in time. So Again, it's um, it's a municipal cemetery, so it is a bureaucratic, bureaucratic French, you know, operation. Um, but it's beautifully run. Again, the current conservator, and they change over years. Um, the um, historic uh, office of parks and gardens oversees all of the cemeteries, and I think French governance changes um, administration every four years. So we hope that every year someone who oversees the parks and gardens is somebody who has a passion for cemeteries. Sometimes there haven't been, and so funding doesn't go to the cemeteries for restoration. Um, again, the city, um, I think, has underwritten the restoration, the ongoing restoration for Chopin's grave and some other, you know, Napoleonic generals and some other key um, tombs and so forth. But um, it's a big challenge to really maintain a place of that, you know, to keep 5,000 trees, 
You know, the arborist is a full-time job. Um, I know that I was there one winter and there were high winds and they made everybody exit the cemetery because of falling branches. And um, so it's a lot of work, but it's, again, it's, it's almost indescribable to tell someone what walking through a forest filled with beautiful sculptures is like, so. Yeah, well, your book is a great place to start. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so um, do you know, um, is there an admission or do you need to make reservations? In no, it's, it's again, it's a yeah. public cemetery. It's open to the public. It opens, I think at 8 a.m. And I think it switches in the springtime in the winter, but it's usually open about 8 a.m. and closes at 5 p.m. So as we were talking earlier, Jill, about, you know, the recommended times, springtime is beautiful because of the beautiful floral. I mean, the, 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 the landscaping is breathtaking. But it closes at five o'clock and dusk is at 8 p.m. So you miss that you miss that beautiful um, sunset lighting that is there. So that's why I always prefer to go in the fall where you get sunrise literally in the early morning and you get that beautiful dusk like that picture of Chopin with that wonderful light that, that shows. So, you know, different seasons have different kind of auras about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Uh, do you know if you um, go there, are there any uh, lead tours? Yes, there are. Um, Thierry, um, what is his name? Oh, it's called Necromantiques. <laughs> um, Thierry Leroy. Um, again, you can almost Google tours. And there are several people, both in um, many languages, that offer tours, you know, personal tours. They're a little, well, I wouldn't say, who am I to say if they're pricey or not? It's like 30 to $40 per person for a, maybe a two hour tour. But again, it's, you know, I like that, you know, getting lost is half the fun because you discover things that you never, I, you know, I was never even found Oscar Wilde's tomb on my first visit. I never made it that far north. He was at the far end of it and I never got out of the romantic section. I mean, Chopin and Bernini and all of these places, I was just enthralled. So um, again, there's, depending upon, you know, your destination. And you mentioned earlier, um, kind of in passing, can you, before this, you and I, um, a couple of weeks ago, had talked about your app and the walking tour. And I was very interested in that. Can you go into a little bit more detail about, you know, how somebody could use your app here and kind of do their sure. own tour? Well, my, my sister, she's my, um, my, my guinea pig for everything. <laughs> she's edited the copy. She's done. And, oh, I, I don't have my phone here with me, but, um, it's literally both for Android and Apple, and it's it's the entire um, chapter on the tours. Um, it does give a little history of the design and the iconography of funerary sculptures. It has again the same section about the hours, the the metro section, you know, stations close by, and so forth. But it covers all eighty four what I call the cultural icons in the three tours. It has a picture of the tomb, which is extremely helpful when you're going through there. I mean, I didn't know what I was looking for. So it took, I mean, it, I, I still have a few people on my list because it's been so difficult to find them. And even with the historians that I know, we would all go in together and say, have you found this tomb? Have you found that tomb? So each one um, gives a little brief biography of the individual who's interred there, a little bit about the, um, about the design of the tomb. And again, what's nice about it is that you open it up um, when you're at home, you can just click on the person's name, that tomb will pop up, you'll see the picture, the bio, there's a little place you can click on to the next one. When you're in the cemetery itself and it gets goes live um, with the uh, GPS app, um, you'll see a little orange line. So in case you're, again, this is, it's covered with trees, it's got tall monuments, so the satellite connection get, could get a little wonky. So I've got a little orange kind of breadcrumb thing that one can follow from tomb to tomb to find each individual um, site. And that again gets uh, kind of turned on once you're inside the cemetery. So, but at home, um, my friends do enjoy it because you get, and again, I'm working on the French and uh, English audio. Right now it's, um, it, it written translation, but people say, no, we want to put our ear pods in. We don't want to read. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> so I hope by this fall to have the audio completed. 
Okay. Something. <laughs> I think that's great. I think it's so cool. And then um, what is what is the name of the app when people search in their app store or their Google Play? If you go into Pere Lachaise, P-E-R-E. -E, Perfect. Okay. Um, mine is, um, you'll see, because it'll, it has the same, the, the female figure sculpture, which is my favorite, um, and then it's City of Immortals, and that will, and quite humbly, I'll say it's one of the better ones on the market. Um, other ones um, don't have the, the, as many, there's one that has like maybe 20 people, and I have 84, and plus, I also say where the restrooms are <laughs> and you know where the exits are and you know and also note some other really beautiful kind of sites there that like there's an entire section that is for the holocaust which is a, a really uh, amazing section to go through on the far eastern side in the jewish section and those memorials are just really riveting to see and it's not necessary it's gertrude stein is buried there but the other tombs are more memorials to um, Belson Belson and uh, some of the other ones. So um, again, it's pretty comprehensive and um, I have pictures of the individuals. So you'll remember what Sarah Bernhardt looks like. And if you never knew what Bernini looked like, <laughs> there he is in Cherubini. Um, and what else? I, I just, you know, I, again, I've tried all the other apps to try to check them out and see what they're like. and. I find mine is pretty simple and straightforward and hopefully a helpful tool for people visiting. That's great. Yeah. And that's a great alternative too. If you, you know, you want to take a tour, but you really don't feel like following with somebody you want to go at your own pace. So I just love that. Um, you can tell I'm a big app person. So I, I think that's really genius. Well, I've become an app person. I mean, it was, I found, I interviewed a lot of companies and I found a wonderful developer in New Zealand and they are, we're still we're, we're kind of reinventing it all the time and it i guess it came out in 2016 so we're always fine tuning it and expanding on it and so forth and uh and i got to build it i learned how to do an app i mean i'm not the techiest person on the planet and so i'm still learning <laughs> that's great um, any any wrap-up questions from anybody in the audience any last minute speak now or forever hold your peace <laughs> um so first of all i just want to thank you so much for coming this was wonderful oh, thank you for inviting me this has been wonderful to share with everybody yeah I've, I've been looking forward to this um for a long time so thank you and um we also just for um our patrons or patrons who live in the area um that we have several copies of the book here at the library um all of them are checked out right now but you can place a hold um, but of course, you know, we love to support authors um, and local bookstores. So you can purchase a copy of the book um, on um, Carolyn's website. It's a city of immortals.com. And um, also, if you live around here, you know, there's some great bookstores in Winnetka and Northbrook um, in Chicago. Um, uh, so. <clears throat> And uh, thank you so much, just wrote in, we love, love the Wilmette Library. I have to give that a shout out. Thank <laughs> you so much. We love you. Um, so, and I just, you know, I was telling Carolyn beforehand, this was, um, I think it's a really awesome book. I think it's, it's a good weight. It's a good size. Um, the pictures are really beautiful. And I just think it's a really high quality book. And again, there's the map in the back. So even if you never get there, you have this really <laughs> awesome map. So, um, so I just, and it's I a wonderful that. gift. If you know someone who's going to Paris, this is, Ordinarily, again, a lot of people, I found there are a lot of people that love cemeteries. On Facebook, I belong to a group that has 27,000 members, who knew? <laughs> but it is an, an, a kind of a unique gift to give someone who may be going to Paris for the first time and have never thought of visiting a cemetery. But um, again, for those pilgrims that go to Jim Morrison's grave, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's kind of a phenomenal experience. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, we have we have definitely have some big cemetery fans um, in Wilmette and around. We've done kind of similar programs to this in the past. Um, you know, we have obviously some very wonderful cemeteries in the Chicagoland area, and there's also a really great old cemetery um, here in Wilmette. So um, that has really old gravestones. So I I do think this is kind of a book that will appeal to different parts of different people. I think it gives you a whole perspective, a new perspective. I'm always now looking at the different designs 
um, all of the kind of different layouts and, and so forth that, and they have a really distinct character, which really expresses the people of that town or that era. And historically, it's become really fascinating to explore that kind of um, option in, in travel and tourism and so forth. So yeah, yeah. I'm on that, I'll see. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, somebody wrote and said that um, they're going to Paris in September and we'll check out your app. Um, and they, they're they also very grateful to know where the graves and the restrooms are, which, yes. and I agree, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> There are three, <laughs> grateful. Bring your own tissues, one thing I would say, <laughs> just in case, <laughs> again, it's very popular. There are many, and again, go early if you can. Uh, September is a beautiful time of year to be there. But, um, and during the week, the weekends are very busy uh, because it is a high, you know, again, tourism de destination. So, but any time is great. I mean, it's just really, you know, enjoy and take your time and, um, explore it's quite an extraordinary experience i think yeah great okay and then just a, a quick reminder um some of you may have heard the beginning i have recorded this program um and it will be on caroline it's going to be on your two your youtube page is that correct yes city of immortals i will get the the link from you and i'll put it up on the city of Immortals youtube channel okay. Great, it will be there. It'll also be on the Wilmette Library's YouTube page. Um, I would say probably sometime next week, just as an FYI, so give us a few days to download and disseminate. And I just wanna say again, thank you so much for coming. This oh, was my pleasure. Lovely. Is, my, my pleasure, Jill, thank you. And thank and, you everyone who came this evening. And then I actually wanna give one more um, quick plug if I can, since we're all you know in the death mood. Um, and uh, at the end of August, I'm leading a book club discussion um, at the library. And it's called Advice for Future Corpses, um, a practical perspective on death and dying. Um, if the weather holds up, I'm going to do it in um, on the lawn in front of the library and we'll have chairs out for everybody. Oh, so, how wonderful. <laughs> so if you want to come and discuss this book, there's lots of copies at the library. Feel free to come. In case of rain, we'll, we'll come inside. So... <laughs> Go. I want to feel on that. Everybody's going to qualify for it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I hope everyone has a lovely rest of your evening. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Good night. Night.